So, well, good morning, everybody. Welcome back. And it's great this morning because we're continuing our discipleship discussion, as you well know. Different topics have come up. Next week, we're going to kind of review all the topics that have been exposed to us in these weeks. But today, we have decisions of a disciple. The Ds are very important. The demands of a disciple, the decisions of a disciple, defining discipleship. We've done all that. That's sort of like, I love alliteration. But anyway, today, we have the privilege of having David Moomy with us. He's no stranger to us. And so David has taught for us before, and he's graciously agreed to do a session today. So thank you, David, for joining us, and we look forward to what God has to speak to us on decisions of a disciple. So yeah. without further yeah. ado, Dave. Great. Thanks, Donna. Yes. <clears throat> Maybe we could just open with prayer. Mm-hmm. Father God, we just are so grateful for this opportunity to get together and to, um, to look at your word and to study your word and to... Look at what you have done on our behalf, Lord, that while we were still sinners, you sent your son, Jesus, to die for us yeah. and uh, be the, the payment for our sins, uh, the one who lived the righteous life for us. And he is the one who we follow, Lord, um, because we know that there is no other better way. It's an awesome path. It is um, an awesome relationship that we have with you through your son, Jesus, and it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, um, so this morning we're talking about decisions of a disciple, and Mr. John Marcinek is going to continue that theme next week, uh, decisions of a disciple. Uh, I kind of outlined what we were going to talk about this morning up here, uh, talking about our decision to become a disciple, to talk about do we follow or must we follow, and then look at some reasons for um, becoming a disciple and following Jesus, and then uh, some questions. So just to start us off, um, deciding to become a disciple, Mm -hmm. is that decision even ours, Mm -hmm. or is that God's? Do we decide to become a disciple, or is that something that is... um, entirely in God's hands. Uh, And there's two schools of thoughts on this, and I didn't want to go through this whole thing, but just give you an idea of what we're talking about. So, out of the Reformation, um, out of Calvinism, there's one school of thought that says um, that people are completely depraved. So people are completely unable to uh, come to faith on their own. And it is the work of the Holy Spirit. The election, it is God's sovereign election. It is something that that God has sovereignly decided who is saved and who is is not saved. Or in in different flavors of Calvinism, who is saved and then the rest rest happens. Um, Atonement, salvation... Over and against that is this um, idea of Arminianism, um, proposed by this person, Arminius, who said, no, no, this isn't right. We have, um, we are fallen, but we have the capacity to make a decision for, to follow Jesus. And um, it is, it is based upon um, God reaching out with his grace, but we have the choice of accepting or rejecting that, um, that offer of faith. So, I just want to look at this bottom part here in our discussion about um, do we even have a decision? So the Calvinists would say it's irresistible grace that draws us to become a disciple, to follow Jesus. Um, the Arminian and Arminianism would say it is resistible. Um, We can choose to obey or choose to disobey. So the question is, which one is it? I don't know. Has anybody ever come across these terms or or this thinking? The um, Calvinism is associated with the Reformed Church, Presbyterianism. Arminianism is associated with... um, Wesleyanism, and um, the Methodist Church. So that's some of the differences there. I 
you know. Uh, yeah, we, 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 we have this uh, debate in, in my uh, previous Chinese church. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so at the end, I remember our uh, the pastor come in and say, uh, let's focus on uh, the Bible that Jesus, let's stop arguing this. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> that's, that's the answer from the... That's what you remember, yeah. yeah. That's how I remember. Uh, although, although some of the English terms are still struggling, but I understand what you are talking about here. Mm -hmm. You know, because we had that debate in, in my uh, uh, young professional fellowship. We are young Christians. Uh, I, I think I just married my, my, my wife a little bit and then and not just one debate because every time that we have some new brother or sister come from other states, other church come in, this debate will raise again and then boom. And then so every time the, the either, yeah. the, either our elder or the pastor will come in and say, oh, let's focus on that not like this. So thank you. Yeah. No. It's an interesting discussion, and it even goes back to the, the time of the, the Pharisees. You know, they talked about this as well. And, um, it, yeah, with the, the Reformers and the, uh, the Methodists. So some of the scriptures that, that support both positions, um, there is a sense in which we are called by the Bible to personal responsibility. So in, in Joshua chapter 24... Joshua says to the, um, the children of Israel, he says, decide for yourself who you're going to follow for gods. You know, are you going to follow these Canaanite gods or are you going to follow Yahweh, the one true God? Decide for yourself. And he says, as for me and my household, we will follow the Lord. Uh, Jesus' words uh, in John chapter 7, verse 17, he says, anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Um, Mark chapter 8, verse 34 says, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Again, it's this idea of the, the personal responsibility, setting aside yourself and making a decision to follow Christ. Um, so th this idea of the moral freedom, that we are moral agents, um, so some of the scriptures that go and talk about um, Calvinism, um, Matthew chapter 22, verse 14 says, Many are called, but few are chosen. John chapter 6, verse 37, All that the Father gives me I will, will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. So again, this idea of the being chosen by God. And we see this also in, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, where God chooses the nation of Israel out of all the other nations. And Jesus chooses the, the 12 disciples out of all the people who are following him. So this idea of election. Um, and in the book of Acts, Luke's, Luke has a couple of quotes. One is in chapter 2, verse 47 where he says, the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So this idea of the Lord was adding to their numbers. In Acts chapter 13, verse 48, as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. So again, this, calls, this speaks to God, God's work in salvation and God's effective calling. They call that irresistible grace, which is kind of an, I think is kind of a neat term. So... So, is it irresistible grace, or are we free to choose? Do we make a decision? And oddly enough, the answer is yes. <laughs> so, and it would go well beyond this class time that we have to try to really delve into that. But there is biblical evidence on both sides. We are called to be responsible. We are called. We are responsible for our actions. But it is God who's doing the work. I think I, I have the, my own um, experience about both. So, so, so the, I think the first time when I, uh, my, uh, you call the Sishou, meaning my, uh, when I was in the graduate school the first time, yeah, uh, not, not, he, he still, he just one class, uh, uh, one level above, above me. So, and uh, he tried to preach the gospel to me. 
when I was very very tired in the lab, my my cold is has bugs, I'm debugging and very very stressful. And and then he at a break he tried to preach the gospel to me and I rejected immediately because I said I asked him some uh, questions about about the, the the idol. Yeah. In Christian any in Christian entity. And he couldn't answer my question. At least I'm not. I was not satisfied about his answer, so mm -hmm. I said, "Please go away. I, I'm busy here." But after two or three years, uh, my second time to uh, to listen to the gospel, who is from uh, my VP, he, he's leaving the team. He he's be, he's trying to be. Uh, he's on the way to be a full time pastor in Missouri, a very small town. Uh, become a pastor there. So and then I was asking, "What is? Why are you leaving?" Because I knew Costco is going to acquire our company. Why, why are you leaving at this moment? And he said, that's God's calling. And then in the third class when I have Bible study, uh, he called a meeting with me. I accept Jesus Christ. Uh, I think I was chosen. But at the beginning, I reject with my own will. Mm -hmm. Three years ago. So that's why when, when, when in our fellowship, in the Chinese fellowship, we, we, we have this debate. I said... Well, come on, these two things happened to me. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. So you've, you've experienced sort of like both sides of that. Yes. And, and yeah, yeah. That, and that, um, I, I think it's those type of stories that, that work into our, um, our understanding of, of who God is and how he works and, um, and, and evangelism as well. You know, they, like maybe that initial evangelism just sort of planted the seed and then eventually it, it, it grew and... <clears throat> To the point where you made the decision. Yeah. You made the decision, but it was God yes. working in. Yeah. So, so yes. It is, it is our decision, but it's God's election. Um, so, in talking about the decisions of a disciple, the next question may be, um, do we live out our faith, or do we not live out our faith? So, we make a decision to follow Christ. Um, do we need to be obedient to Christ? And there are two schools of thought on this. There's a debate about this under the, the umbrella of lordship salvation. And the people who are against lordship salvation, uh, we would call that free grace. They would say, well, salvation is by, by faith alone, by God's grace alone, and we can't add any works to that. We shouldn't add any works to that. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. Because we can't add any works to this, we shouldn't, for example, tell new believers that they need to do any sort of works. We shouldn't tell new believers that they need to even repent. Right? That's, that's adding works to salvation. And in fact, there's, people have even said that um, and taught that if somebody makes a decision at one point in time to follow Christ, if they assent to the, the, the facts about who Jesus is and, and what he did, and they believe in that, they could go on to become an agnostic or an atheist, and they would still be saved. So against that view is this other camp called Lordship Salvation, which says, well, yes, Salvation is by grace alone, by faith alone, but that faith doesn't stand alone. Works are an outflowing from that, uh, from that decision. The work doesn't add to our salvation, but we still need to take Jesus as Lord as well as our Savior. And that if there's no evidence in your life uh, that that you're a Christian, you know, if you were brought into a court and somebody accused you of, of being a Christian, what evidence would they have to, um, to go with? If there were no evidence, somebody could say you're not really a Christian. Um, so we have A and B, free grace versus lordship salvation. So the question is, which one is correct? Any thoughts? This is a little tricky, right?
and I may have deliberately made it not untrue, but just stated it in a way that um, it, it does appear a, a little bit vague, right? But these are some of the arguments that you may come across. Somebody says, yes, you need to work. Somebody says, no, you don't need to work. Which is it? Uh, so I, this is my thought. So yes, the salvation is a free grace, but if you want to be God's instrument to, um, to benefit more people, you need to put in a lot of work. But if you're just talking about salvation, or, uh, can I be saved? Yes, that's a free grace. You accept it, yes. But can you be really the testimony or the real really instrument in God's kingdom become be usable by God? That you need to put in tons of work. That's just my understanding, my two cents. Yeah, yeah, I think you're, you're absolutely correct. Um, the answer is actually, um, wait for it. <laughs> wait for us. The answer is B, Lordship Salvation. That, that's the, the correct, the orthodox Christian stance. So why is that correct? What is wrong with the, the, the free grace statements? Repentance. you got to have repentance. you got to have repentance, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, did Jesus die on the cross just so that we could believe that he died on the cross and then go live our own lives? No. Um, I think for me, the, the verse that kind of clenches this is um, where Jesus says in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You know, do we love Jesus? Uh, part of being a disciple is loving Jesus. And... Um, you know, recognizing what he did for us. So if you, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Paul says um, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So this idea that we, God made us for a purpose. He made us for good works. And this verse 10 comes right after verses 8 and 9, which we're familiar with, that you know, we're, we're saved by grace through faith. Um, it, it's a gift, but we're created for, for good works. Someone once said, and I had to think about this a little bit, we are saved before God by faith, but we are saved before people by works. In other words, it's those works that show people what is going on in the inside of us, that discipleship. Um, James says, show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works, right? So he also has this, um, as part of his epistle, he says, oh, you believe in God. Oh, that's great. The demons believe in God, and they shudder. You know, they, they at least have the common sense to, to shudder in the presence of God, right? So it's not enough just to say, oh, I believe. There has to be something that, that shows your belief. Anybody familiar with this passage? Um, Matthew 21. It's a story of two sons. So Jesus told this parable about a father. He had two sons. And he said to his sons, go work in my field. So the one said, I'll go do that, dad. And then didn't do it. And the other side said, son said, no, I'm not going to do that. But in the end, he went and worked. So Jesus said, which one did the will of his father? It was the one who went in the field, right? It's, it's the actions that speak louder than the words. So I included a couple of um, statements here. Uh, forgive me for reading off these slides, but I thought this was really good, and I, I think it brings into, some, um, into the discussion why we need works. So, for example, the Westminster Confession. says that good works done in obedience to God's commands are the fruits and evidences of a true and lively faith. And by them, believers manifest their thankfulness, strengthen their assurance, edify their brethren, adorn the profession of the gospel, stop the mouths of the adversaries, and glorify God, whose workmanship they are. 
created in Christ Jesus thereunto, that having their fruit unto holiness, that they may have the end, eternal life. So a very eloquent, kind of flowery way of saying that we need these works. And I just highlighted some of these verses. Um, You know, our works edify the church. They edify our brothers and sisters in the church. We need each other and, and, and the, the Christian works that come from our lives. The works that we do glorify God. You know, that's what we want to do because we love Jesus. We love God. We want to glorify God. It stops the mouths of the adversaries. So we always have naysayers, people who are against Christianity, against the Christian faith. But they don't have an answer for the, the good works done in the name of Jesus. So I included this one as well just to kind of drive it home. This is R.C. Sproul, who's a theologian, um, passed away about five years ago. Um, good works are not necessary for us to earn our justification. They are never the ground basis for our justification. They are necessary in another more restricted sense. They are necessary corollaries to a true faith. If a person claims to have faith yet brings no fruit in, of obedience whatsoever, it is proof positive that the claim to faith is a false claim. So he says, true faith inevitably and necessarily bears fruit. The absence of fruit indicates the absence of faith. We are not justified by the fruit of our faith. We are justified by the fruit of Christ's merit. We receive his merit only by faith, but it is only by true faith that we receive his merit. And all true faith yields true fruit. So the decision of a disciple is to have good works, evidencing our salvation. Um, And I wanted to introduce this as well, because I thought that this was helpful to me in talking about salvation, that really salvation has three aspects. There's a past aspect, which is justification, and that is where we make a decision to follow Jesus, or at some point we we decide that uh, we're going to become a disciple. We place our faith in Jesus as the one who took away our sins, And God declares us righteous. It's as if we were in a court of law and God is sitting as a a judge. And um, they call this the the forensic declaration of God. Um, Even though you have this past history of sin, God bangs the gavel and says, not guilty. Free and clear, based on what Jesus did. So that's the past aspect. The present aspect is this... um, this walking in the Spirit and this ongoing um, day-by-day walk with Jesus, sanctification. So this comes from a Latin word that just means holy. Sanctus is the Latin word for holy. So we are becoming more and more holy. We're becoming more and more like Jesus by the help of the Holy Spirit. And then the future aspect of salvation is glorification, when we finally get to heaven. And John says um, in 1 John 3, 2, that when we see Jesus, we will be like him. So past, present, and future. The, the issue is mixing up the, the justification and the sanctification. So just wanted to touch upon this. I thought these were great pictures. You know, if you're looking for Halloween costume ideas, <laughs> you could go as one of the reformers. We got Holdrick Zwingli on the, the left and Martin Luther on, on the right. But they talked about um, the five solas. Um, you know, they, they, it's faith alone, God's grace alone, scripture alone. Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. And this is, um, this was something, this is rescuing salvation, rescuing the gospel message from the corruption over the years. Unfortunately, this idea, this justification by faith alone, was in itself corrupted, and people said, 
oh, I can do, go and do whatever I want, right? God's going to, Jesus is going to cover me. Jesus is going to forgive my sins. So you can kind of see like where you start with that one idea and then it just kind of veers off, right? Um, you can take anything to an extreme. And the extreme to this, um, I'll throw out another fancy term for you. You, you can impress people at, at parties. Antinomianism. So it just comes from two words, anti and nomos. And it just means against the law. Right? It just says, I'm going to go do whatever I want. Uh, Jesus paid the price. Done. Well, this didn't sit well with some of the people in the Reformation, uh, the people in the Lutheran Church, and they said, no, we can't. You can't do that. I mean, you have to have some, some corporate holy, holiness. You have to have personal holiness. So one of the, the leaders of that movement was this man, um, Philip Spener, the father of pietism. And I thought what was kind of neat about him was that he and his followers, he and um, the people who thought like him, they came up with this idea of the little church within the church of private and small group Bible study. They said, well, we need to have this holiness. We need to know what the scripture says. We need to follow what the scripture says. Um, so out of this movement, uh, which had a big impact on, on Protestantism, from this you had the Wesleyan movement. So the people that um, the Moravians, who John Wesley heard, um, were part of this, this pietist movement. So, so from that, Methodism came up and with a big emphasis on, on holiness. So you can see there's, there's the different emphases here. We have justification and sanctification. We need both. We're not trying to pit you know, Luther against Wesley or anything like that. It's, it's, it's two parts of salvation. It's the justification and the sanctification. And I wanted to be careful, too, um, and talk a little bit about Catholicism, how what we're talking about um, is over and against what Catholic teaching is. Um, so where the Protestant faith says it's by faith alone that we are saved, the Catholic faith would say that Jesus, his death on the cross, kind of opened the door, but we need to step in in order to complete our salvation. It's faith and works. It's a little bit different from that position that we're talking about, the Lordship Salvation. Because they would say that um, you can't really know for sure if you're saved or not because it's faith and works. How much works do you need to do? Well, you might have a high certainty that you're going to be saved. But you, don't, you never really know for sure. Uh, but grace can be increased by good works, they say. And good works are rewarded by different grades of grace. So that's, that's not what we're talking about there. Does that make sense? Does that, um, any confusion on that? It, it, it's, I think it's, we need to be careful about how we parse this out, right? And what this all means. Because we need to be able to explain it to, to others when, when we evangelize. So let me just take a pause right there. Any questions, comments? Observations? I like the certainty of my faith. Mm -hmm. Yes, amen. I, I don't want to live in an uncertain state. Mm -hmm. And so, so that is so powerful, like when you understand that God's saving work is done and I enter into <clears throat> that period and then the works follow is it's just a game changer for everyday living. So I used to, I grew up Catholic and yeah. it, it was both and until honestly until I started reading the Bible. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean and it was the same with, with Martin Luther and we're gonna touch on one aspect of his life as well that he hated um, working for God. He hated this God who just seemed to be so exacting and so demanding. It was just like a, this 
enormous chore for him, right? So it's, yeah. Are, are priests in the Catholic Church certain of their faith? Like, at, at what point in the spectrum of kind of her, I don't know, hierarchy, I guess? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I, I, I'm not sure. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Or? There's always an uncertainty, even, even up to like the bishops. But the closer you are, the closer you are to the apostolic tradition, the, the more grace you are perceived to have had. So it's, it's, it's graded. Yeah. It's, it's a graded level of certainty based on your ministry position. Mm -hmm. um, so those just of us who were in the pews on Sunday were just kind of, <coughs> we didn't have this, so you talked about it, there's not, not the same amount of grace. Mm -hmm. So they have a little bit more certainty than me mm -hmm. in the pew but because not, of their work. But it's still not complete. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hard, hard yeah. And, and and to think that, you know, what we claim is Jesus' merit, and his merit is infinitely more mm -hmm. than anything we could do, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's something that's always kind of stuck with me, like right. that somebody once stated, like what Jesus did on the cross, I mean, Jesus, the Son of God, that that sacrifice, think of how big that was. There's a chasm between Jesus. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I think because of my background, uh, so I, I have been supporting the underground church in China that they're pressed by the uh, CCP, by the communism. Uh, we, we can understand the, the life in those underground church, those Christians, so brutal, uh, pressed by, by the government. So I Part of my vision of my serving is that uh, vocational ministry because with the hierarchy, Donna, you mentioned about, you are not able to send anyone into the area like that. You, you, you cannot because you're already standing up. Yes, I, I have more grace, a different level, the grade of grace. No, you can do not, you can, you can do anything in those areas. Who can do that? The Christian. The regular Christian, like you and me, we can go in, provide service, we can work there, we can create a company there, and then we, but we, we are the regular Christian with the calling from God about spread this gospel to those difficult areas, like Muslim. Mm -hmm. If you say, yes, I, I, am, I, I am the pastor, I, I, I am the, the bishops, whatever, but you cannot get in that, that place. So you have to be someone that's very ready, <coughs> have the calling, then we can carry the gospel to those places to save their soul. So that's my point about the, the different level. That's why I'm the <coughs> fans of uh, 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 Martin Luther. You know, uh, the, 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 you just mentioned the five alone. Yeah. I'm a big believer of that. Yeah, and it, it was a it was a nice way of um, concisely explaining the reformer's position, the, the, really the, the orthodox Christian perspective, the, those five solas. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I put this statement up here, which I also thought was helpful. Our salvation is by faith alone, but that faith doesn't stand alone. Yeah, so. Um, anything else? I think we're about ready to go into the next section. Yeah. Um, to that end, I have some scriptures. I don't know if you all brought your Bibles. Or um, uh, I have some scriptures that I wanted to uh, pull into this next part. Anybody willing to read some, some scriptures? Yeah. I don't know. Seth, that's for you. Yeah. <laughs> this is for me. The big one, yeah. Sit <laughs> <laughs> so up front, get your choice, right? <laughs> That must be said. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Donald, we'll give you one of the large ones. Oh, we'll yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, oh, I think we have just a This is good. I like this one. Oh, wait a second. Oh, I can take that one. Then. Oh. Or, or do you want to take the short one? Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> I tried to pare them down a little bit. You know, I was looking through all of it. You know how it is? You get into the Bible and you're like, oh, this is all good stuff. You know, I want to include all of it, but, you know, we only have so much time. So the question is, um, we're in this third part, the reasons we become a disciple and follow Jesus. Um, 
Why do we decide to follow Christ and what makes us continue? Well, we make a decision to follow Christ and be his disciple when we know how much we've been forgiven. He who has been forgiven very much loves much. Um, There's a story in Luke chapter 7 about the woman um, who came to Jesus while he was at the house of a Pharisee. And she broke the alabaster jar. Hopefully you're familiar with this story. She, she poured out the, the nard. She uh, washed Jesus' feet with her tears and, and dried them with her hair. And the Pharisee, Simon, said, well, this guy can't be a prophet. Otherwise, he'd know what type of woman this is who's touching him. And then Jesus said, Simon, I've got a question for you. And I think that's where I picked up in this scripture. Does somebody have Luke 7? <clears throat> or maybe I forgot to uh, include it. <laughs> so Jesus said, Simon, I have a question for you. He said, there were two people. There was one who owed 5,000 denarii and one who owed 500 denarii. And both were forgiven. Who loves more? And Simon said, well, I suppose it was the one who owed 5,000 denarii. And Jesus said, you're correct. You see this woman, she has, um, she has anointed my feet. When I came here, you did not anoint me with oil. She washed her feet, she washed my feet with her tears. When I came here, you didn't wash my feet. So her sins, even though that there are many, they are forgiven. So we follow Christ when we realize how much we've been forgiven. Um, Somebody have Matthew chapter 11? So Matthew chapter 11 is that passage that talks about where Jesus says... um, My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So the Israelites at the time of Jesus were burdened by the Pharisees' laws and the way that they interpreted the law. This particular passage comes at the end of a discourse where Jesus says, You Pharisees, John the Baptist comes, and he's fasting, and you say he must have a demon. And then I come along, and I'm eating and drinking. The Son of Man comes eating and drinking. And then you say, he's, he's blaspheming. You know, you're like children who say, oh, we played a, a dirge, and you didn't mourn. We played a, um, a happy tune, and you didn't dance. You know, the, the rules of the Pharisees were just so difficult to, to follow. But Jesus is saying that his yoke is easy. And because his yoke is easy... That takes, some of the, the, that takes the onus off of us. Um, and I think that drives the decision to, make, to be a disciple. <clears throat> when we realize how much Jesus loves us, that may cause us to want to follow Jesus and be his disciple. So Paul talks in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I don't know if somebody has that, that passage. I don't know why I hand it out here. <laughs> um, but Paul talks about how the, the love of Christ compels us. You know, we're driven by the love of Christ, but we're driven in a good way. We decide to become followers of Christ and, um, and, and follow him when we value Jesus above all worldly things. Somebody have Matthew, or somebody want to read from Matthew 13? No one has it, I can read it. Sure. Matthew 13, thirteen verses forty five and forty six. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls, and upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. So a really great picture of the kingdom of heaven, right? And the, the willingness of this merchant to go and sell everything that he had just to get that that pearl of great price, which represents the the kingdom of heaven. And we know the story of of many people. Um, We hear some of the stories of Muslims who decide to follow Jesus, and they end up 
being estranged from their families, being harassed by their families and friends, kicked out of their communities because they follow Jesus. Uh, you know, we, we don't see that in, in the Western, you know, European. And, and it's probably the same in, in China, right? Yes, underground church. Yes. I mean, there's, there's a big price to pay if somebody finds out you're a Christian. Yeah. I, I know one of the pastors got put into the jail. Uh, his wife law, lost the job. So they, the kids it cannot get into the school. It's very, very challenging for them. Yeah. Wow. The government, CCP, they target those leaders of the underground church. Mm -hmm. right. Tears in my eye. Please continue. Yeah. No, I mean, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great point, right? It's, um, they wouldn't have done this unless they saw the value in being a Christian. That's actually a great testimony. I, I kind of like this one. <clears throat> we decide to follow Jesus and decide to become disciples when we realize that Jesus is the truth. Um, does somebody have John 6? All right, excellent. Hi, Evan. <clears throat> After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. But Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So many of us were raised in the church, um, but there comes a point where we evaluate <clears throat> what Christianity is all about. And I know for myself, I've, I've looked at this, looked at it from a number of different angles, and yeah, Christianity is the one way that makes sense uh, over and above all these other alternative systems. And Peter is saying the same thing here. You know, there, there were people who had started following Jesus. The passage that Donna read came after the, um, the feeding of the 5,000, and people were following Jesus like, hey, you know, um, Moses fed our forefathers this manna, uh, what are you going to do for us? You know, are you going to give us some more bread here? Or, um... And Jesus said, you're, you're, you're going about it the wrong way. And he goes on to talk about how he's the, the bread of life. And some of these really hard sayings. And people are like, whoa, you're laying on the heavy. I can't take this. So they, they turned away. And then Jesus turned to his disciples. And, and Peter has this magnificent answer. Who are we going to go to? Who are we going to go to? Yeah. So there's a, a little bit of overlap with some of these, <clears throat> these points, but I think it helps drive the point. Um, does somebody have Luke chapter 9, verses 23 and 24? Yeah. Okay. And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So that phrase deny oneself is interesting. It actually means to refuse to have anything to do with. So what Jesus is saying is, when you get to the point where you refuse to have anything to do with yourself, you know, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Um, when we're sick of ourselves, that, at that point, we make a decision to follow Jesus. Um, <clears throat> let's see, does somebody have Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 11? Uh -huh. Yeah. But whatever gain I had, I counted I lose for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything I lose because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ, Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have su suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Yeah, so translators try to make that translation a little bit um, cleaned up, that word rubbish. It's more like a dung heap. So Paul is saying, I consider all this about myself that, you know, the right pedigree of, of Hebrew, the, being raised in the Pharisaical system, having all this knowledge, it's a dung heap compared to knowing Jesus and being like him and being associated with his death and resurrection. You know, I thought this was kind of interesting. We talked about Martin Luther <clears throat> and this quote. He said, 
I did not love, indeed I hated this just God, if not with open blasphemy, at least with huge murmurings, for I was indignant against him. So he, you know, all of his workings, all of his confessions, all of his, you know, climbing the stairs on knees and, and um, all this work, he hated God, but he, um, he set all that aside. Once he went into this study of Romans and found out about, about true grace, about the uh, justification through faith. Okay, just a few more points. We touched on this one already. Does somebody have Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4? And I apologize. Oh, it's this one up here. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless. So this is a, speaking again about the effective calling of the Holy Spirit. So we become disciples when, when God calls us out of the, of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of, of light, the kingdom of his Son. We become Christians and decide to follow Christ when the love of other Christians is poured into our lives. just wanted to share this story about my Aunt Sandy. Uh, she had moved up to Maine, and after the death of her second husband, was going through a, 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 period, a season of grief and a um, <clears throat> season of change. There was a group of women from the local church <clears throat> who came up around her and helped her transition through that, that period. And as a result, she started going to church with them. You know, it's, it's those actions, it's those, those works that um, help exhibit to other people the love of Christ and may help them come into a relationship with Christ. Okay. Um, when we experience the faith of a loved, a loved one or a spouse. Yeah, Becky. To the rest I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Yeah. <clears throat> so, for believers married to unbelievers, Paul is saying, you can have a, an influence on your unbelieving spouse. If they choose to stay in the marriage, you know, stay in the marriage. Um, Lee Strobel, who wrote The Case for Christ, was a great example of this. His wife became a Christian, and he got very upset at this, right? So he went about to try to disprove Christianity. He had this background in journalism and law, and he was like, I'm going to rip this thing apart. And he couldn't. He came to faith. So... Um, we decide to follow Christ and choose to become disciples because we see God's providence in our lives and maybe a physical saving of our lives. Yeah, the Jonah story? Oh, yeah. Make yourself comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, maybe I, I gave too much here. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you, that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not. For the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, 
O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and made vows. Yeah, so this is the excerpt from the Jonah story. It is, um, you know, Jonah's fleeing from God, gets on the ship, God catches up with him, right? Can't outrun God. Um, and the, the, the sailors of the ship are like, get up, what are you doing? Pray to your God. You know, oh, by the way, who are you? You know? So they end up throwing Jonah overboard, and they are just dumbfounded. Like, wow, this is, this is the real thing. This is the real God, you know? So I think at that point, they became disciples of Yahweh when they saw the, the miraculous ending of the storm, you know? Um, and it's also a great example. Sometimes we do wrong things. We disobey God, and God can still use that disobedience um, as wrong as it is in the lives of, of others and to, to uh, execute his will. Um, we become disciples when we become desperate for righteousness. I think this goes along with that idea of, of just being sick of yourself. Um, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, yeah. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, that's the promise that Jesus gives. So we become disciples so that we can have that righteousness in our life. You know, the, the imputed righteousness of Christ and also the sanctification. So just to kind of pull that all together, I wanted to ask some questions. I mean, there are many reasons why we come to Christ. Um, many reasons for why people come to Christ. I just wanted to open it up and ask, you know, if anyone is willing to share this story of how they came to be a Christian. Um, and why you continue in the faith. Mm -hmm. So, I know for myself, I know that the, the faith story is real because I became a Christian when I was 10 years old, and I don't think you can really get anything into the head of a 10-year-old very mm -hmm. effectively and like have it stay this long, so it must be real. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I can share my experience. You know, I... I uh, at the, at the time that I first heard the, the gospel from my uh, my uh, uh, my sister uh, in the graduate school, and I I denied it. I I, I asked him to just go away. I, I'm busy. But after that, in about two three years, um, I was broken totally mentally. Uh, not really mentally, but I would say spiritually, mentally, and also physically. I, I was working in a startup. Um, so tough, so tough. Um, and then, so, and then my VP told me that he's going to leave. This is a huge shock to me because as an engineer, I already know Cisco is going to buy us. You will get a huge profit from me. Why are you leaving? So, and then, his testimony to me is so shocking, and I think I suddenly find out in this planet there's another different animal called Christian can do this. And, and then, so uh, another very good thing is that he, uh, so the first uh, Bible study I with him, uh, he was telling me what is gospel. Second, he told me the church history, which removed, removed the biggest block about idol in the church, in the Catholic church, for me. And then the third thing, a third Bible study, he was teaching me about what is the, gospel, the relationship be, uh, between gospel and myself as the individual. And then he asked me, are you a sinner? I said, no doubt, immediately, yes, I am. Yeah. And then the second thing, <coughs> do you want to be saved by God? I said, of course, certainly. So I think he used, God used my VP with, um, uh, come with a very engineering, structural uh, way to preach the gospel to me. And yeah. that just boom, that just boom. And then I accepted. 
So I think that's why I, I totally at that moment I don't have any any um, bright into myself. So I think that's the perfect moment for me to accept Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the only way um, I am chosen. Yeah, yeah. Anyone else want to share? I, I know I've gone over a little bit. I apologize. Um, the other point that I wanted to bring in here, just very briefly, I think when we look at the reasons why people in the Bible decided to follow Jesus or follow God um, and, and our own experiences and the people we know, um, I think that helps in developing and shaping um, evangelism. Right? If we see how, how people respond and what they respond to, um, I think that helps shape the, the decision of um, well, how we do evangelism. So. Um, I've kept you way too long. I apologize. Any other questions, comments? No? Okay. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure if we needed some time to, like, get down to church. Or... Oh, that's right. Church is so long. So. I just want to say thank you for all the thought and, you know, that went into this. Yeah, my pleasure. And it was really helpful and insightful. And yeah, thanks for your patience, too. Yeah. Uh, thanks I, for sitting. I can second that because the, the scriptures you listed about, you know, what is it that causes us to make decisions? They're so I was relating to every single one of them, and I was trying to think out of those lists, you know, what, what happened to me first? Mine was a physical need. Well, more of a, yeah, it was a need of, in my family situation, so... Um, and then all the other things lined up eventually with that. But I just love that it's so true, right? Like as you, you plot yourself through those scriptures and you, you fit yourself right into the story. Yeah, this is why I did it. And then why I continue to do it, you know, is yeah. just the sick of myself piece. Is like, I can't do any of this. And that's why I need him. And, and that really does propel me for, for witnessing because I, I, I cast it in the discussion of a relationship. I cast, when you, whenever I'm talking to people yeah. about Jesus, and I try to do it regularly, I, I try to frame it in terms of just a relationship to t take away that sort of like, you know, that God, human thing, but then bring it more into the relationship piece. And it always seems to work. You know, people always go, oh, because people are into relationships. So anyway, um, I can just see these three little blocks that you've had that worked really well in my life. So thank you. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we didn't even get into it, but I think it would make a really interesting study also to look at the disciples of Jesus, how they, mm -hmm. what compelled them to follow Jesus and some of their stories. So you think about, for example, Peter, and, you know, Jesus is in the boat and says, cast the net over here, and he pulls in this enormous catch, and he's like, go away, Lord, I'm, you know, I'm not worthy. Um, or even like Philip talking to Nathaniel, saying, hey, we found, the, we found the Messiah. Oh, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, just come and see. Come and see, you know. Could, could you close us in prayer that we would, yeah, I don't know, just that we'd be effective witnesses about our relationship with God and just all that we pray for? That yeah, I'd be, be glad to. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, we are so grateful for um, the gift of faith. We're grateful for salvation, that it is free. And we thank you, Lord, that um, even as we choose to follow you and choose to do these good works, that you continue to empower us. Lord, it is by your Holy Spirit that we are empowered for ministry and empowered to do your work. Um, Lord, would you just take your word and impress it upon our hearts. Show us where we can reach out to people and, um, and witness to others, um, knowing the, the love and the forgiveness and the... Um, the removal of that legalistic burden and um, the greatness of your salvation, Lord. Um, work in our hearts and our minds. Help us to continue to grow in you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.